Doubt, which is the last of the hindrances, is one of the more complex and tenacious. And as you're setting out on the practice, you have to realize that doubt will not be overcome until stream entry. So until that point, you're going to be dealing with it. Sometimes it'll be stronger, sometimes weaker. And it'll come in different shapes and forms, doubt about different things. Some forms of doubt are more insidious than others. There are a lot of issues the Buddha say you don't have to think about. He's not asking you to have any particular view about whether the world is eternal or not, or finite or not. But you do have to develop a right view about what's skillful and what's not skillful, and the best ways to develop what's skillful and to abandon what's not. And you're going to have a lot of doubt about that, because the only way you're going to find out what's skillful and what's not is through the practice. And if you start having doubts about whether this practice is really worthwhile, it's going to cut things off right there. That's probably the most serious of the doubts. Is there such a thing as skillful and unskillful? There's a passage where the Buddha is talking about how to feed and starve the hindrances and how to feed and starve the factors for awakening. And there's an interesting pairing that the cure for doubt is the same thing as food for the factor of awakening, which is analysis of qualities. In other words, you have to develop your discernment. It's not simply a matter of wishing it away or denying the doubt. The cure for doubt, he says, is to look into the mind and apply appropriate attention to the question of what is skillful and what's not. Watch what's going on in the mind when you have certain states of mind, or if you think in terms of the committee of the mind. When you follow certain voices, what happens? When you follow other voices, what happens? And look into the voices themselves, because you'll learn a lot. The voice that says, the path is impossible, that's a destructive voice. The voice says that you don't have any choices, you just have to go with the flow. Everything is totally predetermined. What hope is there? There's really none at all. If you have any hope for happiness, you have to hold to certain views. But you do have choice in the present moment. Any choices will make the difference between whether you're happy and whether you suffer. And there's a pattern that you can learn. If you really care for happiness, these are some of the things you've got to take on. Take on faith. The Buddha can't prove them for you. But they are assumptions that are concerned with your well-being. So if there's any voice in the mind starts calling them into question, you've got to recognize that's really unskillful and it's going to lead you to a lot of suffering, or in the Buddhist terms, lead you bewildered and without protection. Like a person I met one time, he'd been on many retreats doing Vipassana practice. And he was the sort of person who would work nine months out of the year so he could have a three-month retreat. And he'd taken to heart the idea that you should not do anything. You should not respond when anything comes up in the mind, good, bad, what, whatever. You should try to stop things from arising and passing away. And He'd gotten into a really bad depression. Some very dark states arose in his mind. And the Vipassana teachers had told him, hey, step back, don't go into those states. And he told them, well, you told me not, not to try to change anything. And by the end of the retreat, he was so disoriented that they had to let him stay on there at the retreat center to recover. This is what happens when you tell yourself there's no choice. As the Buddha said, he's right. You're bewildered and you're left without defenses. So recognize that voice as destructive. That doubt is a destructive doubt. It's not really doubt, it's more ordinariness. 
But there are other times when you actually have legitimate doubts as to what is skillful and what's not. And so you have to remind yourself, here as we meditate, we're putting things to a test. We're experimenting. And the only way you're going to learn is through experimenting. So if the doubt pulls you back from trying the meditation or continuing with the meditation, ask yourself, well, what kind of experiments have you done? What other ways could you experiment with the meditation? That way you're not being told to deny your doubts. After all, if you deny your doubts, how are you going to learn? There has to be some inquisitiveness in the mind that asks questions and wants to know. And that kind of doubt is actually encouraged. It's the doubt that's not curious. It just kind of gives up, discouraged, defeated. The one that says either, I can't do it. Or this is a bad path. That kind of doubt has to be dealt with. Again, you have to look to see where is it coming from? What voice is saying that? And what is its motivation? What is it looking for? And you find it, if you find it alluring, what's the allure? And if you start asking questions like that, you're actually engaging in analysis of qualities, which is precisely what you need in order to overcome doubt. Now, if the answers are not coming very quickly, you might remind yourself, well, maybe the mind needs to rest. And so even though the doubt may be unresolved, you put it aside for the time being and try to find whatever rest you can. And it's in this way that overcoming the hindrance of doubt you learn how to make distinctions as to which doubts are useful, which ones are not. There's an interesting word in, in Thai, Song Sai, which means both to doubt and to wonder. And the Johns would often say, they try to make the distinction between the kind of doubt which is just doubting and discouraged and the doubt which is wondering. It's the doubt that wonders that can be trained. Because if it just wonders and wanders, it gets kind of useless. But if you get it focused, you start wondering, well, what is concentration like when they say the refreshment or rapture that comes from concentration, the pleasure that comes from, comes from concentration? What is that like? And then you know where to go. As John Lee says, it comes from directed thought and evaluation, centered on one object. So you do that. As for doubts that are more abstract, you put them aside. In this way, your inquisitiveness gets more and more focused on issues that really will be helpful. But it stays right there on that issue of what's skillful, and what are you doing in the mind right now that's skillful, and what are you doing that's unskillful? And if it's unskillful, how do you let it go? We've got to develop dispassion for it. And you remember how the Buddha said to develop dispassion. You look for when it comes, the item that you're trying to get dispassionate for. You look for when it comes, you look for when it goes. You look for its allure. When it comes, why do you go for it? What's the little perception that the mind flashes that makes it attractive? It's like looking for the subliminal messages that they send on TV sometimes. They're there. And if you're quick, you'll see them. And they begin to see that a lot of times the reason we go for these things has very little substance. And yet they lead to a lot of 
suffering, they get they really are obstacles. When you see that the allure, the pleasure that comes from it is not worth it, that's when you let it go. So this is how you focus on the doubt that is actually useful and peel away the doubts that are, are harmful. This is one of those hindrances that the Buddha takes really seriously. After all, if you die with doubt, you might wonder, all well, that good that I did doesn't seem to be getting me anywhere. That's going to be really bad. It's going to pull you down. And you don't want a mind state that pulls you down while your body is really weak like that. And there's all the turmoil and that goes on in the body that's about to die. So you want to be able to peel that kind of thinking away and be done with it. Because otherwise you're going to approach death with a lot of fear. Remember one of the reasons for fearing death that the Buddha cited was that you don't know what the true Dharma is. You haven't seen the true Dharma. In other words, you haven't gained stream entry. But at the very least, even if you don't get to stream entry, you can minimize the doubt by being very observant about your own mind and what is skillful and what's not. Because that's the only way that you can get passed out. Is by focusing on the issues that really matter. The Buddha had a lay student one time who was asked by some wanderers, What does this Buddha teach, this Buddha of yours? Does he teach that the world is eternal? Well, no. Does he teach that it's not eternal? Well, no. Finite? No. Infinite? No. Down the list of the questionnaire of the big issues of the day. And they said, well, this teacher of yours is a nihilist. He doesn't teach anything at all. And the only person said, no, that's not the case. He teaches what is skillful and what's unskillful. To develop what's skillful and to, to abandon what's not. That silenced the sectarians. And the only person went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha said, yes, that was a good answer. So even though the Buddha has a long list of questions, he says it's not worth your time getting involved with them. They just pull you astray. But this issue of what's skillful and what's not, and how you can develop what's skillful and how you can abandon what's not, that's an issue where you have to work your hardest to answer the question. And you do it by being observant. The laboratory is right here. It's in your mind. This is where the answers are. Now, if you don't look here, you're not rising to the challenge that the Buddha set. And in John Lee's words, you're not going to find the truth because you're not true. So be true in looking into the mind, trying to develop appropriate attention as to what's skillful and what's not. And help push aside vagrant doubts and answer the questions that lie between your genuine doubts, useful doubts. So you can get to that point where everything opens up inside. And you see for sure the Buddha was right. There is such a thing as a deathless, and it can be attained through human effort. And that's when all your doubts are resolved. 